Um, right, so um, today I'm going to be talking about building and utilizing purpose-built new Linux distribution images using MQSI. Um, I'll go to the motivation as to why someone would need a minimal image, uh, the examples of configuration files and the statement files taken up by MakeOSI, a demonstration of functions like burn, shroot, build, quemu, and finally how you can contribute to the project. Um, before I begin, though, I want to tell you a bit about myself. I am Akash Deep Dhar. Uh, I've been involved in Fedora project for around five years at this point in time. My day job is working in the Red Hat's community platform engineering team, and I'm also serving as the elected representative in Fedora Council. Now, please feel free to reach out to me if you have, uh, if you want to collaborate on Fedora infrastructure, or you know, you want to do something with the council. So, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide. Right, so uh, why exactly do we need to have a purpose-specific distribution installation? Why can't we just use an ISO image, you know, slap it to a flash drive, run the installation, call it a day, right? So um, the first interaction with minimalism happened to me back when I was jumping distributions to distributions, and I came around this cool thing called Arch Linux. Uh, used by the cool kids in the block. I wanted to be cool, so I tried it as well. Um, so Packstrap was a thing that helped me create a do-it-yourself distribution for, you know, for the custom distribution that I wanted, right? So it wrapped Pac-Man around it. All I had to do was point it to a directory, format a disk, set up host name, host files, and generate an FSTAP file. But I got to understand basically how a Linux distribution is created, right, or bootstrap for that matter. I could install the packages and the services that I want and nothing more than that, and even if I had less resources, I could just do away, no problems. And uh, the configuration could just work fine even if I don't have a monitor if it's a headless setup. So, um, of course, uh, being a distro hopper back in the day, I started looking into other places where I could do the same thing. And uh, I came across two things, both of which are in the libgestfs software suite. The first one is dbootstrap. Uh, yeah, the name suggests, you know, it's Debian Linux. So uh, it installs the base system in a subdirectory uh, as long as you have an access to Debian Linux repositories. It's available in other distributions as well. And if you want to generate a cross-architectural image, so if you have this x86 PC on which you want to generate images for Arch Linux, Arch64, not Arch Linux, you could do that. And uh, if you want to use that as being something that feeds into your package building pipeline, you could use that as well. And Supermin, which was curiously enough, previously known as Fee Bootstrap, so Fe, Fedora, but yeah, not just Fedora, it also supports Debian Linux, uh, but yeah, it was called so until 3.0. It creates a minified purpose-built image that they call a client. And just like dbootstrap, it uh, uses package repositories, and it's also available across various distributions. Um, and it can create also virtual images that can be booted with Quemu. And this resembled an additive Manufacturing in mechanical sciences, so it's like you know building things with a 3D printer. You're adding stuff on the top of each other rather than you know removing them. So there's nothing to begin with, and you add stuff as you go on. And talking about more alternatives, um, I was looking for something that's distro agnostic, right? So um, what if I want just one config that works everywhere? So I came across two things: cloud init and ignition. While they both more or less look the same, work the same, but they have significant differences. Um, cloud init is, as the name suggests, cloud-centric. So, you know, cloud-centric distributions can make use of it, while Ignition is used for container-optimized distributions. Um, so cloud init makes use of a YAML-based configuration format, while Ignition uses a JSON-based, although you can use uh, a YAML and then convert it to JSON later. They both require a custom template image to start with, and they execute on the first boot for initializing installations and uh, to configure elements like users, partitions, networking, etc. And this is what resembles uh, a subtractive manufacturing way of mechanical sciences. So you have so, a block of plastic, right? And you're cutting things apart that you don't need in order to come to an image that you would end up using. 
And finally, um, there's something that happened in the last August when I came across Make OSI, even though, well, I wish I saw it before because it's clearly a lot more capable of a tool. Uh, I took it for a spin when I got to know in the Infig News talk in Flock to Fedora uh, to see how versatile it is. Um, so just like Bootstrap and Supermin, I could create distribution installations from scratch like additive manufacturing and I could use the same config for a variety of distributions like RHEL, CentOS, Stream, OpenSUSE, Arch Linux, Ubuntu, just because what it does is it is just a fancy wrapper around the package management. Um, the configuration is very human readable, it's extensively customizable, so even if the config does not do what you want it to do, you can write your shell scripts and you know add it to phases where you wanna add it to it before it starts executing or when it's finalizing or when it's done installing, you could do that. And the most important part is that it's reproducible, so the image that you get from one config is gonna stay the same throughout. And the deployment target is also very variable, let's just say. You know, the, it can generate a subdirectory that you can shoot into. It can generate a raw archive image that you can use as a container using systemd and spawn, or a virtual image, virtual machine using Quemu, or you can flash it on a hard drive or a, on an SD card or in a flash drive to boot it on a physical hardware, you can do that. Or if you hate bootloaders, you can also build a unified kernel images from it. I think it requires systemd UK5 to do that, but yeah, it's one of the dependencies when you install MakeOSI. Right, so um, using MKOSI, I was able to ensure that I had a finer grain control on not just the system's behavior or the packages it had, of course I would do that, but also on the services that it ran and also the files, maybe I wanted an image with a certain wallpaper or a certain theme using KD Plasma, a certain version, I could do that from the get-go. I could create an isolated inf environment that's tailor-made for testing. I would really not wanna let the testing be hampered just because of external uh, circumstances that's not related to the code itself. And all of it is managed, like I said, by wrapping the most popular package managers out there. And even if the configuration options are not enough, I could use customization hooks, scripts that run during preparation, building, post-installation, finalizing, it can be tailored to how I felt like it. Right, so um, here's a quick run view of the configuration file section. I won't be talking much into it because it clearly is boring to say the least, so I'm gonna show examples. But yeah, most of these things uh, mean exactly what they say, so it's, it's very semantic. But talking about the non-boring parts, the examples, Right, so um, here's an example configuration of uh, something that works in MKOSI 20.0. Uh, if you try running it in older version, it might not work. It might, but yeah, if it does not work, don't hold me accountable. <laughs> right, so uh, the first part of the configuration file has two sections, distribution and output. Uh, I've chosen CentOS as the base distribution, 9stream as the release, x86 underscore 64 for architecture a near uh, India um, mirror for better speeds for myself, and no repository checks at all, uh, just because I just wanted this image for debugging purposes. And in the output section, I have the disk image as the formats, into a stream as the output name, JSON and change logs as the met metadata types. That's the image version, and that's the image identifier. And the second part has, in the content section, it tells that the output image has to be bootable, that's the name of the bootloader, um, systemd boot, because, well, why not? And I provided a collection of packages to install, so it won't install anything apart from the dependencies that it requires, but not one. So no, no optional dependencies, no recommended ones. It will have network access enabled during the entire phase. That's the default local, uh, the default time zone, uh, the default host name, and yeah, that's that's plain text password, yeah, it's over there. <laughs> for the root account and the default preferred shell for the root account with auto login disabled. And here's a use case example of what exactly I'm gonna do with this image. 
I'd simply download um, a source from some place. I'd create myself a user first to uh, do all these things to download them, install poetry, and uh, just check the configuration file to see if it's working or not in a in a controlled environment, right? Right. So um, let me see if it ends up working. I'll have to play this by myself. Right. Let's. Let's hope that the internet works here. Right, so uh, I'm not gonna play this entire thing because it's like, what, two minutes long? I could, but this talk was decided to be a 50 minute long talk, so we clearly do not have 50 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go give a quick run through of what's happening. Uh, the first thing that happens is, of course, the CLI options and the configuration files are passed here. There are no CLI options. It's just the configuration files that I showed before. And depending on the execution user, if you're a root user, which, yeah, it, it was a pseudo. So uh, depending on that, the namespace is either restricted or shared. Then the noted directories, depending on if they're available or not, are either remounted or they're just unshared. And the packets manager trees with base and skeleton are copied over to the working directory. So you need to have the package manager of the distribution that you're looking to build there. And I think Fedora has all the package managers like APT. You can install like sudo DNF APT. Yeah, I know it sounds strange, but yeah, you can do that. Um, then install the distribution and requested packages. The scripts for the distribution preparation, building, the post installation and finalization are run in the places where they're supposed to. Then the configuration of SSH auto login or in RD, if there are any, I have one for auto login uh, generated, and then the system D sys users dep mod, system D first boot, system D WDB are run one after the other, and finally, if there are any residual files, you know, they're they're cleaned up, and the files that are uh, there are relabeled to uh, with Linux, and the image is generated in the format that's requested by the user. So yeah, I think we have reached the end. So even if when I said that we don't have the time, we clearly did. So I'm gonna get back to this one. Next. No, no, we don't wanna do it again. Right, so application examples. So uh, why do we need a minimal image? Why can't we just use something that's out there? Um, of course, the first thing comes in mind is infrastructure for, for uh, environments that are immutable, right? You don't want them to change after they have been declared. Um, it can be helpful over there because it clearly helps you get a greater level of consistency on the packages installed and uh, the configuration for the services that's out there. Um, for embedded environments, you can have you know, you can make do with limited amount of memory, limited amount of processing capabilities, and limited storage just by keeping things that you need and nothing else apart from that. Uh, containerization, um, sure, you can use the popular OCI images, but if you need services, you can containerize them using systemd and spawn. And finally, testing. I won't go in detail, but you just saw what the testing example was. So um, it prevents queuing of test results just because the place where the tests are happening are, um, it's consistent across the board. And finally, in education, uh, if you want to set a certain environment up for running laboratory tests for, say, certification examinations, you can have the same environment across multiple people taking their tests, and that way you can really control the testing environment. Um, development, as it goes without saying, you know, you have disposable environments where you want to test things out that can break things, but you would really not want to break the environment where you're testing stuff. So definitely a disposable environment helps. And finally, controlling the building, testing, and releasing cycles where you need a tailor-built environment to, to do these things. And you just reutilize them as you see fit. And depending on if the requirements change, you can obviously you know, update these. Right. So. Um, Let's talk about a demonstration of how these images that we just built can be used. 
before we do that, let's let's talk about the environments where we'll use them. So um, we can use them on a physical hardware. If we flash that raw archive image on a flash drive, um, I wouldn't suggest that, to be honest with you, because of read-write speeds. But if you're adventurous enough, give it a shot. Or you can flash it to an NVMe SSD or, or an SD card if uh, you are trying to run it on a Raspberry Pi. Or you can run it in a true jail for debugging purposes or running applications in a limited scope shared namespace. Or you system DN spawn, again as a container, but uh, for a separate namespace isolation. And finally, if you have that image, you'll just, you can simply virtualize it using the virtualization software suite, uh, Quemu, KVM, Libvirt. You can simply use those and read this as if it were a machine image and it would work just fine. Right, so um, speaking of burning things to a flash drive or to a physical drive for that matter, it's basically that easy to do that. I, I mean, you could use DD. Why would you use this? But again, it, you can use this as well once your image is ready and you can simply point it to a block device and the generated image would be flashed. If the image is not generated, it would be generated first and then it would be flashed to the device that you're pointing at. You would really want to be sure that it's the same device because, yeah, it's going to overwrite everything that's in there. All right, so, um, truth. Um, if the output format is directory, then you can truth into the directory using truth. I mean, that's basically how you do that. I don't know if that required a demonstration, but here it is if you are looking for one. Um, then, using system DN spawn, you can boot into the container image. Uh, the output needs to be the raw image archive, and the first phase that happened was system D D part uh, that was executed, and here's the information about the kernel, so you do see that it's still the kernel of the host that's being shared over, so it's it's the same namespace and uh, not a different one. And finally, if we're really looking for that kind of isolation, um, we can boot those images as uh, a virtual machine using the virtualization software. So it, you know, if you have Quemo installed, you can simply uh, do that. You do need to have certain variables configured, like uh, to, to determine how much memory you need uh, to allocate to this, how much virtual core counts you'd need to have. But in case you don't have them already assigned, it's assumed to be two cores as a default. The memory assignment is also two gigs. And I think the network access is uh, a NAT-based assignment done for this. And yeah, now that it's booted up, you'll see that it has the kernel of not the host, but what was installed atop this image. And yeah, there it is. There's that. Right, so um, that is basically how you can run it as a virtual machine. Let's move on to the contribution part, how you can contribute to this project. and. The easiest way to get started is by using it, by you know simply taking it for a spin and understanding just how capable it is. And you'll soon realize that there are some boundaries to how it works. And once you re realize those boundaries, those bugs, those features that you want to be there, but it's not there, you can report them in the issue tracker, or you can suggest them. And if you have any confusions, uh, you can always reach out to the GitHub discussions. Uh, I have done so uh, a couple of times over the last few weeks, and I have known just how good the turnaround time is, so you clearly know that this is a project that's being worked upon actively, and people really care about that. And finally, you can find use cases to share. So um, I literally had a use case for testing projects out. I'm pretty sure people would be able to find things with which they're building stuff or using this in their pipelines to automate, because it's clearly possible to do just that. Once you're comfortable enough, you could totally participate in the contribution, you know, attend meetings, write documentations, or 
Well, if you're confident, it's, it's, it's mostly Python, so uh, you can also author code bases, answer discussions if you know about the topic, but um, do, do consider contributing. And yeah, that's about it. Totally feel free to reach out to me on these links, which are too small to be seen. Apologies, but uh, yeah. Um, if you have any question, now's the best time to ask it. I'm pretty sure that the questions that I won't be able to answer, I have better people to answer them. <laughs> so, uh, yep. Thank you so much for listening in. <laughs>